It's Jim Martirano from All About Town, and I'm honored to have a special guest today. But let me just paraphrase, uh, let me go back a little bit. I've been doing this show for 27 years, and I've seen a lot of public servants come and go, and I've been lucky and happy to have them on the show. But nobody, nobody of all the people I've interviewed over 27 years is more dedicated or has produced more for his community than the person who's my guest today. And that is State Senator Peter Harcum. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jim, and thanks for the kind words. It's the truth. You know, if you look at uh, local news or you open your local paper, everywhere you see, you see uh, Senator Harcum uh, doing something positive for the community. It's really extraordinary. The poor man has no life other than <laughs> serving us, which makes us very lucky. So, I, I, you know, a lot of us don't have time to really review what's going on, so I just wanted to ask the senator if he could just review some of the the important points that, of things that you've accomplished recently, the budget. You know, believe it or not, Democrats have reduced taxes, and they have consistently under his leadership. So can we go over some of the things? What are the things you're most proud of that you've accomplished in the last couple of years? Well, thanks for having me, Jim. And, and to your point, um, this year's budget was crucial. New Yorkers are still hurting coming out of the pandemic. They're hurting financially. They're hurting emotionally. Um, so this budget was all about investing in New York's recovery. $3.6 billion in tax cuts, middle class tax cuts, uh, property tax rebates, um, small business tax cuts, uh, record investments in education to lift our students up and yet hold pro local property taxes down. New York is finally uh, paying its fair share of, of the education tab for our young people so that all our young people, regardless of zip code, get a high quality education and compete in the international market. Um, so 16, 13 cent gas sales tax holiday uh, for the next six months because we know people are hurting it at the pump. Infrastructure money, um, money for our communities. So this is really about investing in the recovery of New York. One of the other things um, in the budget is, is $200 million in grant money for small businesses. And the reason it's there is last year we had a very successful program based on my bill, $800 million in small business grant funds. Because during the pandemic, small businesses told us they couldn't afford any more fo federal loans, they needed grants. And so we used federal money to create this grant program, very successful last year, and it's back this year. We've been through a terrible pandemic. Uh, I mean, I think last time we talked, we had masks on. And, uh, of course, it's affected all of us. Do you see New York's uh, economy recovering? And are there any indications, any numbers on that? Well, the, the numbers that we saw during the budget season um, were positive. As you look out five years, sales tax revenue were up, tax collections were up, contrary to the, you know, the hysteria about people fleeing the state. Uh, tax, tax receipts were up, and they're looking good for the next five years. Obviously, where we are with the economy, we, we want to watch carefully. Um, but we need to have a balanced budget in New York State. And so we were very prudent uh, with the investments we made. Some of it was uh, federal money. Uh, some of it was state money. But it's important that when people are hurting, that's the time you need government most. That's not the time to contract. That's the time government services need to be available to support people and lift them up. Uh, one of the misconceptions because of the federal government uh, is that the towns or, or uh, counties or even state government can run a deficit. They cannot, by law. Only the federal government can run a deficit. So how many years now, uh, Senator, have you been um, in this position? I, I've been in office for four years. We have a balanced budget every year. As you say, it is, it is required by law. And it's important also to send a signal to the bondholders and to Wall Street that, that we are fiscally responsible and we meet our responsibilities. You know, every once in a while you'll hear someone railing about debt. What that is, is that's like a mortgage. That's infrastructure funding. That's money for bridges, for roadways, for sewer, for water projects. So that's money that we bond. Yes, it's, it's technically borrowed money, but it's not like we're spending to pay our, our daily bills. Yes, I remember when I was a councilman, uh, we always had the uh, dispute or debate over do we pay for the whole thing at once or do we bond it? And my position was always that bonding made more sense for the precise reason that the bridge or whatever your roadway is going to last 30 years uh, and 
you don't want today's taxpayer to foot the entire bill of something that's going to go on for 30, three more decades or four more decades. It's fairer that taxpayers over the time that use the roadway, use the bridge, pay their fair share. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that, that's very true, and it also allows you to better leverage your money because if you pay everything as you go, and you can do that for smaller projects, but if you pay as you go for every individual project, you can do far fewer projects. But when you're borrowing money, especially at low interest rates, you're able to leverage that money over 30 years, and you're able to get a lot more accomplished. Now, talk a little bit about your accomplishments with regards to veterans. I, I've seen in the paper the various events that you've been at to help vets, uh, and, and I applaud you for that. But could you just update our audience a little bit about that? Well, I, I serve on the Veterans and Homeland um, Affairs Committee. Uh, we take our veterans very seriously. My father was a veteran of World War II. My grandfather was a veteran of World War I. So last year, the governor signed into law my bill, which will uh, make it easier for veterans in congregate care settings and their families to get the benefits that they've earned and they deserve and trigger a response from a state um, case officer to go to that location to, to work through um, any issues they may have. And they may not even know that they or their family are entitled to benefits. So this will, this will get folks there. Just here in Yorktown, um, the other day, Assemblyman Byrne and I, uh, along with uh, Supervisor Slater, um, announced a, a federal bill, that a, a state bill, that the governor signed, that Assemblyman Byrne and I passed, that renames the walkway over the Yorktown the Atomic Veterans Memorial Bridge for those veterans who were involved in America's nuclear program, were exposed to radioactive fallout. Many of them were sickened and died, and we want to honor those veterans for their service as well. So uh, congratulations on that. That's a beautiful thing. What is a uh, typical day in the life of, of Senator Harkham like? Well, it, it depends on whether we're in the district or we're, we're up in session. But in any event, they start very early and they end very late. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in Albany, um, meeting with, with my legislative staff, meeting with um, stakeholders, meeting with activists, meeting with, with folks on both sides of bills. We have committee meetings and we'll conference for an hour or two. Then we have session uh, and sometimes more meetings in, into the evening. When I'm, when I'm in the district, it's the same kind of hours, except that we're, we're meeting with local constituency groups. Um, constantly throughout the year, our team is doing constituent service, whether it's um, unemployment benefits during the pandemic, um, when the Department of Labor collapsed, uh, our, our team helped a thousand people in the district and their families get the unemployment benefits that they had earned and deserved, um, whether it's utilities and power outages or when we had the, the spiked bill crisis. Um, that's what our team is there for. And that's, that's really job number one, I believe, of being elected representative is, is making the wheels of government work for your constituents. So if somebody's watching the show, and they have some type of issue and they'd like to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? The best way is to call the, the main district office in Peekskill, and the number is 914-241-4600. And that, that'll take you right to uh, one of our Cracker Jack team members, and whatever it is um, will get you to the right place you need, you need to be. Now, of all the things you've accomplished, and you've accomplished so many things, it's almost impossible. Well, it's impossible to put it on this half an hour show we'd have to have a four hour show what are the what are the three things you're most proud of i i would say on on the environmental side we've had some big wins um in this year's budget we passed my wetlands bill which will protect millions of acres of wetlands in new york and while that may sound like a touchy-feely thing wetlands are the filters for our drinking water supply and millions of acres of wetlands have been paved over and now we're paying hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up our drinking water supply. So if we just let nature do its work. So that was a big one. Um, classy streams, 40,000 miles of classy streams will be protected for the exact same reason. Um, on, on the climate side, starting in 2035, all vehicles sold in New York will need to be zero emissions. That, that was my bill. Um, but I, I think really it's, it's on the um, substance use disorder side, the opioid crisis. That's an issue that's very dear to me. I chair the Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse and 
co-chair our task force on opioids addiction overdose prevention. Just this year alone, we passed uh, 23 of my bills in the Senate. I take a tour of the state every year. In fact, we're leaving um, next week to go to Syracuse, Ithaca, Rochester, Buffalo. Wow. That'll be the central New York leg. And then we'll do another leg in New York City and Long Island um, to find out what the gaps in the system are. And we're constantly um, plugging those gaps. Fortunately, this year, thanks to Tish James um, and, and the, the settlement funds that she was able to get from the pharmaceutical companies, and, and the, having a new governor really makes a huge difference in this fight. Um, you know, she's a great partner. And so with, with their combined efforts in the legislature, we've increased funding on the opioid crisis by half a billion dollars. Wow. That's a 56% increase. Um, and I think we're really going to start to see um, some marked mark improvement. Have you seen anything uh, come out of the bill, you know, the bridges and the, the, uh, the infrastructure bill that they passed on the federal level? Do you got, get involved in that on the state, or does that go to the local municipalities? Well, it's an interesting bill because some money will come directly to the state, and then the state will use that money as part of its larger infrastructure pool for roads, for bridges, for, for water uh, infrastructure. There's money in there for earthen dams. So many of our communities have these old earthen dams, and DEC is saying you need to replace those dams right. because they've outlived their useful life. And, and what municipality has $3 million lying around to replace a dam? But some of that money is also competitive. So municipalities can, can compete. They apply to the federal government for other money. States can apply. One of the things that, that is coming out of, of it is $175 million to New York to build out our electric charging infrastructure. As we transition to zero emissions vehicles, largely electric, um, we need to have the charging infrastructure in place, and this $175 million from the federal government will go a long way to jumpstart that. The other thing is in the Environmental Bond Act that will be on the ballot this year, $4.2 billion in resiliency projects, clean water, uh, 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 jumpstarting um, our, our efforts to, to, to green our economy um, and take carbon out of the economy. Um, there, there's going to be $500 million for electric school buses for, for our local That's municipalities. Great. That's, That's great. absolutely great. We did a, a big demonstration project over at Fox Lane High School, and we had a, we had a massive uh, electric bus come from West Virginia. Uh, we had a great presentation, but the future, the future is here now. The technology is available now. These things only take an hour to recharge. The range is is long enough for the, the size of our school districts and the hills and the cold right, weather. Right. And, so, and so between the Bond Act and the federal government, we'll really make great progress. And you know, the, the thing that people don't realize, whether they believe in climate change or not, I'm not going to get into that argument. Clean energy, renewable energy is cheaper. So what's wrong with saving money? Everybody loves to save money. Wall Street now invests more. This is a private sector. Wall Street invests more now in clean energy projects than they do in carbon-based or nuclear projects because it's much less expensive to produce a kilowatt of clean energy than dirty energy. Who doesn't want to save money? Well, you got me there. About, about 100 yards from here is the, uh, is the farm, you know, produce farm where I buy a lot of vegetables. Uh, my wife likes the watermelon. I go there all the time. Uh, and I'm there the other day. And a woman pulls up in a Tesla. And I had never really looked at these cars before. And uh, she saw that I was curious. She said, oh, let me show you the car. And, uh, of course, she opened the front. She opened the back first. It was a spacious back, you know, a trunk. And then she opened the front, and there was, there was no engine, you know, you know. And, of course, there's no engine. But I was like, where's the engine, you know? And she said, there's no engine. And uh, she had a computer uh, thing inside the car, which does apparently everything in the car and I, I had to wrap my head around the fact that there's no engine you know but there's also no exhaust I mean you don't have to worry about you don't have to worry about the gas prices you don't have to worry about anything except and I asked her about it you know, how hard is it to charge your car she's not hard at all she goes home and she plugs it in right uh, and there's a converter you can get or they give it to you and you put it in your regular house and you plug it right in and then in a matter of no time 
your car is good to go. I, I asked her, uh, how, what is the range? She said over 300 miles. So she can actually go on a trip for 300 miles, and you never see this woman at the gas pump complaining. Like when I go to the gas pump, people are swearing, but she's never there. She's, uh, she drives by and she waves. And, and you it, know? it is far less expensive to charge your car with electricity yes. than it is gasoline. Yes, Whether saying. prices are high or prices are low, it doesn't matter. It's still cheaper. Now, one of the barriers for more people getting into the EV vehicles um, has been the price. Obviously, Teslas yes. are a pricey thing. 2025, General Motors is coming out with 25 electric models. So a lot of the models that they have right now are being electrified and will come out. I think the game changer right now is, is Ford F-150. I'm not promoting any brand, but this is a production-grade truck, 100% electric, as tough a, a, of a construction yes. vehicle, and no more expensive than the really? current gas same model. Price. Exact same price. Three-year waiting list, unfortunately, because it's so popular, but that's I think that's a game changer. When people can buy the same vehicles for the same price, only they're electric, and we're going to start seeing that explosion in the next few years. It'd be nice to have no no gas prices and cleaner air. I mean, that would be wonderful to have some clean air. Now, I was shocked at the Tesla, and I, I see these other cars coming out that are even fancier. Uh, and you're right, the problem is the price. So you're, let's hope you get elected, and I urge everybody to go out and support this man. He certainly earned it. A lot of public officials do not earn your uh, vote again, but this person does. Uh, what do you have on the agenda should you get reelected? Do you have thoughts or plans or visions of what you want to accomplish in the next term? Well, there, there are a couple of things. One, we want to make sure that we see New Yorkers through the pandemic and through the economic uncertainty. That's, that's job number one. We want to continue to make investments in our municipalities and our local first responders. I've already brought close to $11 million in direct assistance to our municipalities and our first responders. We want to continue that support. We want to continue to address the opioid crisis and climate change, uh, which is an existential threat to, to our civilization and, and our kids' future. So there are really so many important things that we still need to address. We're making enormous progress in New York, um, you know, whether it's common sense gun safety, whether it's pr protecting a woman's uh, right to choose reproductive health care, um, the things that we're doing on climate change, the things we're doing on the uh, protecting our fragile drinking water supplies. We're making great progress, but there's more to do. Last night they released uh, the video um, of that unfortunate incident in Texas, in the school, uh, where this young, young man, the murderer, had this, uh, what, what, AK? AR-15. AR-15. I don't know why I want to say AK. AR-15, and the truth is that the poor police people, uh, they were outgunned. I mean, they could not go in there because they were going to get slaughtered as well. And it's, un, it's a and terrible... That's, that, that's exactly what happened in Buffalo um, when there was a massacre at the Topps supermarket. Yes. There was a former Buffalo police officer who was a security guard who went to confront um, the, the twisted psychopath. Um, he was outgunned, and the young man had body armor on. So... That was also very personal because my, my colleague Tim Kennedy's, one of his chief staffers, her son was shot through the neck because he was at the grocery store, you know, by some sick white supremacist who got his hands on an AR-15. So we immediately went back into session, raised the age from 18 to 21, and now require a permit in New York State um, to, to um, apply to purchase uh, a lo semi-automatic long gun. The other thing we did was we banned body armor because when the when the the security guard um, uh, discharged his weapon at this guy, the shots bounced right off the body armor, and and then the this individual was able to to shoot the the security guard um, with with greater firepower. So we will continue to protect the Second Amendment in New York, but we will also strenuously um, continue. Uh, our efforts for, for gun safety to keep our families safe. It's a matter of sanity. No, uh, the children need to be protected. Uh, and, in, you know, mental illness is rampant. People are getting more and more extreme in their views. And when you have weapons like that available, uh, you just 
It's just a crapshoot on what's going to happen next. But, but you know, Jim, the, the thing when people talk about mental illness and violent crime, people who suffer mental illness are ten times more likely to be victims of crime oh, than to perpetrate crime. And, and we need to remember that. There may be some of these grotesque cases where obviously someone is deranged and should have been hospitalized and slipped through the cracks. But, but ten, you know, more, more than ten times they're more likely to be victims of crime than to be perpetrated. And, and speaking of that, in my practice as a legal aid lawyer for 45 years, um, I saw so many clients that were the victims of mental illness yes. and uh, in the criminal justice system. And there was just not enough resources in the system dedicated to helping them. How, how do we stand on that? And what's your vision of what we can do in the future to help people that have are suffering and yet they get involved in the system? Well, part of the problem was for the last 10 years, spending was held flat. And that was essentially a cut. Medicaid rates were cut. The reimbursement rates were cut. So the treatment providers had less capacity. Um, and, and the pandemic really showcased the, the crisis our, beha our entire behavioral health system was in. So we've begun reinvesting $500 million, um, in this budget um, for uh, staff retention and recruitment because folks could make more flipping burgers than they could um, caring for our most fragile residents. So we've begun that, $50 million for the first time for school-based mental health programs that our, our school districts have been crying for. For the first time, a reversal in, in the 10-year trend that eliminated ju juvenile mental health beds. We're now increasing juvenile mental health beds. So again, new governor, um, terrific partner and and we we are beginning to change the curve in our, our behavior you mentioned education again uh, you're you work hand in glove with our educational system both on the state level and in your district can you tell us a little bit about any new initiatives that are coming down to help our school districts well the the biggest is is funding we um, two years ago made the commitment to fully fund the foundation aid formula uh, which every student is legally owed um, so last year we got to 60%, this year we're up to 80%, next year we'll be 100%. So in the four years I've been in office, the school districts in the 40th Senate District have gotten a $116 million increase in funding since I've been in office. $116 million. That benefits our students, it benefits our taxpayers, it benefits um, our administrators and our teachers, um, and it, it, it really... Um, it helps pave the way for the future for our kids to compete in the global economy. That's wonderful. Uh, now, as you go, you've been wa going around the district, whether it's campaign season or not. You're, at, you're everywhere all the time. I don't know how you do it. Uh, but what, when you've been going on recently around the district, talking to people, talking to folks, what is the sense you get? What is on their minds? What do you think the major complaint or worry or concern is that they have? Well, it, it depends on, on who you speak with. You know, some people, it's recent actions by the Supreme Court on, on reproductive health care and, and common sense gun safety. Other people, it's economic issues. And other people, it's, it's behavioral health issues. You know, people are really still struggling coming out of the pandemic. We shouldn't underestimate the impact of that. There's no shame in coming forward and asking for help. We've got to break the stigma about people asking for help for behavioral health issues. Um, and so, so you know, we still have a long way to go before New York fully recovers from this pandemic. Now, what's it like when you go to Albany? Uh, uh, you're on a number of committees. Could you just highlight some of the committees you're on and, and what you like about them? Sure. I, I spoke before about the, the committees I chair. Uh, I also serve on environment and conservation, um, energy and telecommunications, uh, both of which are very fascinating and on the forefront of protecting our, our water quality and climate change. So those are important. And then the Finance Committee. You know, literally everything goes through the Finance Committee. We're the ones who have the budget hearings. We have every commissioner before us. Um, I have learned an incredible amount about state government through serving on the Finance Committee. Veterans and Homeland uh, Security which I also mentioned um, is a great opportunity to help our veterans. And finally, the insurance committee. Um, you know, I never thought I would, I would be serving on the insurance company, but as I learn more about the behavioral health network, so much of it is wrapped up in the insurance Absolutely. world. 
and, and, and the, the barriers and limitations in our insurance system. So that's why I'm on that committee, and it's interesting work. Yeah, I just said, you know, I've been going through the health care system recently with a loved one and dealing with the insurance company is whether or not you have the surgery or not depends upon the vote of the insurance company. And they give you a hard time, and your doctor has to intervene. It's really a shame that when it comes to our health, even life and death uh, crisis, you have to worry about what will or will not my insurance company cover. And based upon that, you decide to have the surgery or not, which is just an awful situation. Yeah, these decisions should be made by um, patients, families, and their health care providers, not, not insurance companies and, and not elected officials. So we're, we're running out of time, but uh, I, I can't thank you enough for being here today and sharing. Your, I know you're very busy, and you got you got you got to leave here and go somewhere else. But I just want to ask you if you could look in the camera and tell the, the people watching out there uh, why they should put their trust in you this November. I know why I'm putting my trust in you because you've earned it, and there's nobody better uh, at helping us and taking care of us than you are, than you are. But if you could just give a little pitch, perhaps, to people that are watching that may be on the fence, that may be saying, you know, I'm sick and tired of the, of the high gas prices and I'm going to take it out on any incumbent. Uh, why should they turn to you uh, this time again? Well, first, thanks for having me, Jim. And I think at times like this, experienced leadership is really important. And I've been blessed to be in public service for a number of years. And we're getting real results for New Yorkers. And while the rest of the country seems to be in turmoil, we're cutting taxes here in New York. Um, we're protecting women's uh, reproductive health care, common sense gun safety. We're making advances on climate change. We're investing in our small businesses. We're investing in infrastructure. We're investing in uh, the people of New York, our behavioral net network, our education system. Um, you know, it's really easy to say, oh, cut, 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 cut. But that's what got us into these problems. And we need smart investments, and that's what we've been doing with the new governor, is investing smartly in education and health care uh, and, and our small businesses so that we can move New York forward and lead the country once again. So if you're as impressed as I am with this young man beside me, uh, perhaps you could tell a, a listener that might want to help in your campaign. Now, take off your hat as a, as a public official and put on your hat as a campaigner. How could somebody get involved in your campaign? Who could they call? What can they do? Well, thank you. You know, it, it's so important to, to reach out to voters individually, to knock on doors, to make phone calls, to write postcards. Our last two campaigns have been grassroots campaign, great volunteer support, um, and we, we always uh, uh, thrive on volunteers. So if you'd like to get involved with what we're doing, um, we could surely use your help. You can go to my website at Pete4NY, that's PeteFORNY.com, and there's a volunteer button you can click on, put in your information, and someone will call you back within 24 hours, and we'd love to have you on the team. What about a contribute button? Is there a button? To there sure is. There, there, sure is. is. there sure is. Campaigns there's a big are expensive. One. Yeah. There's a big one. <laughs> and it's better. It's much better to have a grassroots campaign that's financed by people, uh, you know, individuals rather than corporations or, or uh, interest groups that, that uh, I, I think are a problem in this country. Well, thank you so much, Senator. It's been um, wonderful having you on the show. I hope to have you back on the show after you've been reelected to talk about the, the next term as it, as it proceeds. But, again, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to have you here. Thank you very much for having me, Jim. Always a pleasure. Thank you. This is Jim Martirano from All About Town. Thank you for watching, and I hope you tune in next week. Have a good evening.